Hi guys, I just wanted to do a quick video here. I realized that I actually haven't done whooping cough on my channel. So here's a video on pertussis. Grab a piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. There's a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to receive any notifications of such amazing content every time I post. Grab a piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. Today we're going to be discussing whooping cough or pertussis. Some people pronounce it as pertussis, however you want to pronounce it as. So the word pertussis actually comes from the Latin word to mean intense cough. I'll play you a clip of how this actually sounds like quite shortly in this same presentation. It's one of the acute respiratory infections that's also referred to as whooping cough. And remember, it's quite endemic throughout the world, though the incidence has reduced from the past because we're now even vaccinating people against pertussis. Pertussis is only going to cause disease in humans, so there are no animal reservoirs, and it's going to be caused by a bacterium that's known as Bordetella pertussis, or B. pertussis. There is another type of organism that's known as Bordetella pertussis, which causes an illness that's rather similar to pertussis, but though it's a milder form and it's less severe. The Bordetella pertussis organism is a gram-negative organism. It's non-motel, it's quite small, and it's a cocobacilli. And remember that the transmission is going to be occurring through inhalation of these micro droplets, which consists of these infected microorganisms. And this usually happens during the cutterophases phases and the early paroxysmal stages. Because this makes sense. These are the stages where someone is sneezing, they're producing a lot of these secretions, very easy for the transmission to happen. And remember that this condition is very contagious. About 80% of the patients that are caring for someone that has pertussis are actually going to be contaminated or be infected with pertussis. Transmission can happen by contact with uh, the contaminated articles and formites, though this is quite rare. And patients usually are not infectious after the the third week of the paroxysmal phase. Remember that this is a vaccinate, a vaccine preventable disease of childhood. So we do immunize people beginning from the age of two months. And this has actually been quite effective in us actually reducing the incidence of pertussis overall. But of course this immunization is not like lifelong. It lasts for about 20 years. And so even adults sometimes could get infected with pertussis. And some adolescents could actually even act as carriers for this particular thing. So universal vaccination is recommended at two months, three months, and four months. I did a video on vaccination and immunization. I will actually leave it tagged at the end of this video that you can actually watch if you haven't yet already watched. So these are combined diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis vaccine that are given uh, from the age of six weeks. We give three doses of 0 0.5 mils at four week interval. So it's six weeks, at 10 weeks, at 14 weeks and then a booster dose at one year after the third dose. So the infants that are younger than six months of age are the ones that are going to be at most risk of severe disease because these are the ones that have this immune system that's not yet fully formed and some of these defense mechanisms are not yet fully formed. And the adolescents and adults whose immunity has um, weakened over the past years are going to be a major source of pertussis along with the immun unimmunized children or those that are under immunized. And remember this condition is very infectious, it's highly contagious. Even the passive immunity that children usually get from some other conditions, we don't see that with pertussis. So the plasma, or rather the placental transfer of these antibodies is not going to protect the younger infants from pertussis. So generally when you get infected with this, remember it's going to be producing a toxin, which is known as a pertussis toxin, along with many other things many other biological active substances, and these are going to be what are going to be triggering the inflammatory changes that we see, and this is what is central to the pathogenesis of the condition. The Bordetella pertussis is going to invade into the respiratory mucosa. It's going to cause an increase in secretion of mucus. It's also going to be, this mucus is going to be blocking the airway. Initially, it's going to be thin, but later on it can actually become quite thick. It can become viscid and become tenacious. And remember that this mucosal lining of this respiratory tract are going to be inflamed, there may be necrosis, and some of these cells may actually shed off in this squamate, and this can actually lead to obstruction 
of the airway. It may lead to a telectasis, it may lead to accumulation of these secretion. And resultant is that there's not that um, adequate gaseous exchange and this patient is going to be cyanotic, there's going to be some hypoxia and this can affect the liver and the brain. Remember that the incubation period of this condition is roughly about 7 to 14 days, so the maximum of three weeks. And most of the times, if someone has uncomplicated disease, it's going to last for about 6 to 10 weeks. A patient is going to cycle through three stages. So there's what is known as the catarrhal phase, which is 1 to 2 weeks. It's going to be lasting about 1 to 2 weeks. It can last an average of about 14 days, then, or rather 10 to 14 days. Then you have the paroxysmal stage, which is lasting about 3 to 4 weeks then the covalescent stage, which can last weeks, sometimes even two months. So begin with the catarrhal stage. So like I said, about 10 to 14 days, lasts one week. It's quite insidious. It's quite gradual. So here, just like most other respiratory infections, you're going to get this flu-like symptoms. So there are going to be these upper respiratory tract symptoms. So things like sneezing, lacrimation, rhinorrhea, nasal congestion, conjunctival redness, and even other signs of chorizal illness. I'll also leave the video for chorizal illness tagged at the end of this one if you haven't watched it. There may be anorexia, listlessness, even some low-grade fever, though fever is quite rare in this particular stage. And these children are going to have this cough that is at night. So they'll have this hacking cough that is at night and then eventually you get to see it even during the day. Hoarseness of the voice may sometimes also occur. Then they go to the paroxysmal stage. After about 14 days, they go into the paroxysmal stage, which is going to last about three to four weeks. And here, that's where you have the hallmark of the disease, the hallmark of pertussis, which is known as this paroxysms of forceful or these bouts of forceful coughing. So there's going to be an increase in the severity. There's going to be an increase in the frequency of the coughs. And you can have about five repetitive coughs that are coming consecutively and these coughs are going to be this forceful coughing that is going to be occurring during a single bout of expiration and then afterward there'll be this whoop that's going to be followed which is simply this hurried deep inspiration so remember that a whoop is just this inspiratory gasp against a partially closed glottis and then we hear this at the end at the very very end of the coughing bouts and usually the whoop is heard rarely in infants young infants because they cannot generate enough pressure in their respiratory system the coughs can actually be quite exhausting so they'll tire the child easily and usually after the child coughs quite a lot they end up vomiting so this is quite common the, in the younger infants, they may become cyanotic, they may become apneic, some of them may even be chok choking during these paroxysms. And uh, in between the bouts, the children may actually be well and they may even be afebrile. They may produce this copious, viscid amount of mucus and sometimes there may be some bubbles that will form from the nares during or even after these bouts of the cough. So here I want to play you the cough. I just want you to actually pay some close attention. It's about 20 something seconds. So I want you to listen to this. <laughs> Okay, so remember that pertussis is one of the things that you hear just once. You would never miss this. Even if it was to come to in, in an exam, you would never miss how this actually sounds like it. It would be like a spot diagnosis thing. So the next stage is the covalescent phase, which is going to be lasting weeks to months. But the average duration of illness is going to be roughly about seven weeks. But it can range from as little as three weeks to as long as three months, sometimes even more. So here the coughs will still continue, but they'll become less frequent and they'll become less uh, severe over time. And remember that this cough could sometimes even persist for a very, very long time. So we actually tend to refer to it as the cough of 100 days. In terms of diagnosis, generally in our setup here, diagnosis is mostly clinical. So usually it's very difficult to differentiate the catarrhal phase from conditions like bronchitis, from conditions like influenza, even adenovirus infections, even TB should be considered when you're dealing with a child with pertussis. Diagnosis can be confirmed by identification of organs, which could be, of the organism rather, which could be done by two things. It's either you culture it, which is also very difficult for you to do because it requires special type of 
agar medium, special type of plates. And you could get the nasopharyngeal secretions and you culture them. This is the gold standard. So remember that the cultures are going to be positive in about 80 to 90% of the cases. And if you get it in the cataral as, as well as in the early paroxysmal phase of the condition, and because you are going to be requiring this special media, you're going to have a prolonged incubation period, then the laboratory should actually be notified whenever you are suspecting that this is a pertussis case, because I think this should be one of the notifiable diseases. Another test which is actually much more sensitive and much more preferred is the positive direct uh, fluorescent antibody testing of the nasopharyngeal secretions, or you could do your PCR or the nasopharyngeal swab. So the PCR is actually much more sensitive much more preferred for patients. When you do a full blood count, you're going to notice that there's a lymphocytosis. So generally, the white cell count would be between 15 to 20,000. And it may be normal, or it may be as high as even 60,000. And usually 60 to 80% of them are going to be small lymphocytes. When you do your ESR, what is quite remarkable is even though there's an infection, your ESR is going to be low. The differential diagnosis includes viral infections like adenovirus, influenza, and respiratory syncytial virus mycoplasma, foreign body aspiration, endobronchial TB. In terms of treatment, remember this is highly infectious. So all the children that are young infants, these ones, those that are in the paroxysmal phase, they want to hospitalize them because there's a risk of them choking. There's a risk of them becoming cyanotic. There's a risk of them developing apnea. And you want to hospitalize them and actually isolate them, respiratory isolation especially for those that are seriously ill because you don't want to transmit this to other people. And you continue the isolation until this person has received up to five days of antibiotic therapy. Supportive care and even oxygen, if needed, are very important, are quite life-saving. So even as little as just suctioning and removing the excess mucus from the throat could actually be life-saving for the infants. Sometimes oxygen and tracheostomy, even nasal tracheal intubation can be needed in this particular patient's Expectorants, cough suppressants, cough mixtures, and even mild sedation have shown little value and even according to the clinical trials have shown little uh, things or little help or out of little help in these conditions. Anything that can disturb this patient is actually going to precipitate this serious paroxysm of coughing and sometimes it will lead to anoxia, completely no oxygen going in, the airways will close. So if the patient is seriously ill, you want to keep them in a dark room, which is quiet as possible and with little disturbance as possible. Some patients may benefit from nebulized mist or even salbutamol. It may be helpful for some patients. And remember, the patients that you're going to treat at home, these ones should be isolated. They should be isolated from a susceptible infant or for at least four weeks from the time the disease onset actually started until the symptoms have subsided. Antibiotics should be given, and these are not going to actually change the clinical course of the disease. They'll still cycle through those stages, but they're going to prevent the spread of infection. So generally, we're going to be using macrolides. Azithromycin is one drug that we use. Erythromycin is another drug that we can use. Erythromycin given at 10 to 12.5 milligrams per kg orally every six hours with a maximum of two grams per day. We give it for 14 days. Azithromycin can also be given 10 to 12 milligrams per kg orally once a day for five days. Trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole combination can be used as a substitute for patients that are greater than two months who are not really tolerating or actually hypersensitive to the macrolide antibiotics. Remember that antibiotics should be used for the other complications that we see like the bronchopneumonia, which may be super added, even the otitis media. The antibiotics, like I told you, are not going to alter the clinical course of the disease and um, unless if we administer them during the cataral phase or even in a very early paroxysmal phase, but otherwise they will not really change the clinical course of the disease. And we'll isolate our patients until they have received at least five days of antibiotics. Continue the nutrition with small, frequent, easily swallowable uh, food, and this should be caloric, dense food stuff that should be given. Do not force feed any child because they may aspirate. And feeding is usually better soon after the bout of coughing, because again, if they're coughing and you feed them, they'll aspirate. So all contacts, irrespective of whether they have symptoms or the age, whether they're immunized or not, should be given prophylactic antibiotics for two weeks. For those that are unimmunized or incompletely immunized contacts, then they should schedule to complete the immunization program. Then those that have received a vaccine dose more than six months back, they should receive a booster. 
So generally, how do we prevent this? Remember, active immunization is the one of the ways in which we prevent pertussis. And this, we have now incorporated this as part of standard childhood vaccination that I will leave at the ta at the end of this video. I'll leave it tagged at the end of this video. So five doses of a cellular pertussis vaccine can be given at the ages of two, four, and six months, and at 15 and 18 months, as well as at four to six years. Then immunity after the natural infection actually lasts for about 20 years. And the close contacts that are less than seven years who have had four doses or less than four doses of the vaccine should complete the recommended childhood vaccination schedule. And then there are some candidates that actually are going to be for post-exposure prophylaxis. Remember, this should be given to household contacts within 21 days of the onset of the cough in the index patient, whether or not they have been vaccinated or they haven't. So people that do qualify should receive either a 7 to 14 day course of oral erythromycin, 500 milligrams four times a day, or 10 to 12.5 milligrams per kg four times a day. Alternative antibiotics you can give include things like clarithromycin and azithromycin. Then for the infants that are less than one year, azithromycin is preferred for post-exposure prophylaxis. Now, the individuals that were going to be giving this post-exposure prophylaxis are going to be those that are following or are in this category, those that are infants less than 12 months, those that are women in the third trimester of pregnancy, all people with health condition that may be potentially exacerbated by pertussis, for example, those with immunosuppression, those with moderate to severe asthma, those with chronic lung disease, people that have a close contact with infants that are less than 12, pregnant women, or even patients with conditions that may result in severe illness or complications. All patients in high-risk settings that include infants that are less than 12 months or women in the third trimester of pregnancy, for example, those that are child care centers, maternity wards, neonatal intensive, intensive care units, all these must receive the prophylaxis. Complications may be associated with the respiratory system, which are the most common type of complications. It could be a secondary bacterial infection, an otitis media, an emphysema. You could have air leaks, which could be pneumothorax or even pneumomediastinum. You could have subcutaneous emphysema. The complications could arise in the CNS during the paroxysmal stage. These are quite serious, so they may have seizures, they may have encephalopathy, or they may be associated with a severe cough. For example, subconjunctival hemorrhage, because every time you're coughing, there's increase in pressure in various vessels, which can cause them to rupture. You may have retinal hemorrhage, you may have epistaxis, which is nose bleeding, you may have intracranial hemorrhage, you may have inguinal hernias because of the increase in intraabdominal pressure. You may have rectal prolapse, even diaphragmatic rupture, though it is rare. For those that have a prolonged course of disease, they may have vomiting, poor feeding, which may ultimately lead to malnutrition, and there may be also some flares of underlying tuberculosis that can also occur. I really hope you enjoyed this video on pertussis. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel. Hit the bell notification icon so you never miss on such amazing content every time I post. To Zambia and beyond, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.